Hello and welcome to Business 360. I'm Shireen Pan. The headlines we're tracking for you this evening. Indian equities recover from early lows as traders digest the shock from weak economic data. The Sensex and the Nifty end with modest gains of around half a percent each. The slow than expected growth in India's GDP sends the rupee spiraling by over one fourth of a percent. The currency hits a new low of 84 rupees and 70 paise to the dollar, but traders say likely RBI intervention has limited the hit. The 5.4% GDP growth numbers stokes hope for a rate cuts, but the CNBC TV18 Citizens Monetary Policy Committee votes 3 is to 2 for a cash reserve ratio cut. Doesn't see a repo rate cut given high inflation. The RBI's committee will meet later this week for what will be Governor Das's last MPC meet unless he is given an extension. CNBC TV18's newsbreak is confirmed. The government scraps the windfall tax on aviation fuel, crude products and petrol and diesel with immediate effect, also withdraws the road and infrastructure says it levied on the export of petrol and diesel. The government has mopped up 44,000 crore rupees from windfall tax since FI23. Sales of sports utility vehicles hit top gear in November, but passenger cars, commercial vehicles and tractors see muted to demand. Two-wheeler exports shine, domestic sales remain under pressure. EV segment leader Ola Electric sees a sharp drop in market share in November as TVS and Bajaj Auto narrow the gap. Promoter Bhavish Agarwal pledges close to 4% of his shareholding in the company to raise debt funding for his artificial intelligence startup Krutrim. Parliament lockdown continues. Both houses adjourn for yet another day without any significant business being transacted. Opposition MPs demand discussions on allegations levelled by the US authorities against the Adani group, the violence ensemble and the Manipur crisis. Tensions in West Asia escalate. Israel prohibits residents of a dozen South Lebanese villages from returning to their homes and continues to bomb parts of Gaza. Meanwhile, Syrian rebel fighters capture a majority of Aleppo, making a significant escalation in their ongoing conflict with President Bashar al-Sayed. Cyclone Fengal may have weakened, but it continued to disrupt life in large parts of southern India. Flooding reported in Puducherry and parts of Tamil Nadu on sustained heavy rainfall. Schools and colleges in Tamil Nadu, Karnataka and Telangana are ordered shut. Southern Railway suspends operations in various stretches. Well, the top stories, but let's now get you more details on the action in the equity markets. Friday's GDP print of 5.4%, which was not just much lower than expected, but a seven-quarter low made for a weak start to the trading week. But the indices did recover soon after that, as most of this shock has already been factored in. And we've already seen uh, those brokerage uh, downgrades coming in. Hopefully, the RBI will be prompted to cut rates. At least that is the hope within industry when the RBI meets later this week. The Sensex and the Nifty managing to end the day with modest gains, so 145 points higher on the Nifty. The Sensex about 440 points higher. The Nifty bank flat, 600-point gain there coming in for the mid-cap index. That was the story as far as the markets are concerned. Let's go across to Prashant now. He joins us to put the day's action into perspective. Prashant, uh, uh, you know, started weak given uh, the macro data that we had to contend with and finally closing in positive territory but flat. Well, markets once again delivered the lesson, the old lesson that uh, they are forward-looking creatures, not uh, machines to price what is already in the past. And that is exactly the reaction which shown through. Uh, I mean, over the weekend, of course, uh, everyone was uh, anxious about what the market will do because uh, of the GDP shocker, uh, the five-handle number. But guess what? Uh, you know, the, we started lower and then almost immediately within the first one hour, there was a sharp recovery. We ended the day with a half a percent plus kind of gain on the Nifty. Up on your screen, the Nifty Bank did very well as well. Mid-cap and small-cap indices, even better. I mean, actually, these are the two indices, the broader markets, which have done well last week, beat the Nifty and the Bank Nifty, and they've had a better start compared to the bigger indices uh, this Monday as well. Now, sort of uh, large caps uh, which participated, Cement was the standout sector. Ultratech and Grassim from the Nifty did well. Apollo Hospitals, Sriram Finance, JSW Steel and Adani Ports were some of the other names which uh, participated. On the lower side, uh, life insurance companies, I mean, after our stories last week, I mean, continue uh, to be under pressure. HFC Life was the biggest loser. Sipla and NTPC were the others which were under pressure. In the broader market, I mean, uh, at one point in the morning, declines outnumbered advances, but that completely flipped in the first, uh, in the second hour and then really never looked back. Dixon was the big winner. Inox win. Hikal Limited, big volumes, big gain. Castrol, 6%. Affil India, happiest minds. There was Nelco, Black Puck, which is a recent listing. Ola continues to see some re repair and recovery. Himmat Sinka, the textile apparel maker. Goldium, the artificial diamond company. Uh, Cosmo First, huge laggard 
uh, saw some gains today. And you had these paper names. I mean, they all usually go up or go down in a pack. JK, West Coast, Star Paper, they all did well. Uh, on the downside, I mean, you know, there was Adani Energy, Adani Total, which were lower. I mean, these stocks have recovered quite a bit from the recent lows. AG's Logistics was a loser. Imami, BASF and Acme Solar, which is a fairly recent listing, were some of the others which were lower. I mean, one just hopes that it's not a repeat of last week because last week also Monday started and the week started on a euphoric note. And then, of course, it sobered up over the next three, four trading sessions. One hopes with, of course, a little bit of help from uh, you know global markets as well that things are on the mend. All right, Prashant, many thanks. That was the equity market action in the currency market. The rupee did not have an easy time shaking off the shock from the economic data. It weakened around one-fourth of a percent, hitting a fresh all-time low. Now, dealers say some of the weakness was limited by dollar selling by banks, presumably on behalf of the Reserve Bank of India. The global dollar rally, which started soon after Donald Trump won the U.S. presidential elections, continues to weigh on the domestic currency as well. So that's the dollar rupee for you. But let's get back to that lower than expected 5.4% GDP growth number for the June-September quarter for just a bit. The fact that this is a seven-quarter low has economy watchers and brokerages worried. Many have lowered their full-year growth forecast for India. Here are a few of them. Let's start with UBS. It's lowered its FY25 real GDP growth forecast to 6.3%. It says that while a sequential pickup is likely in the second half of the year, both monetary and fiscal support will be needed to take growth towards 6.5%. Let's now move to Citi. It has revised its FY25 real GDP growth peg to 6.4% from 7% earlier. And Goldman Sachs has lowered its FY25 growth forecast by 40 basis points to 6% but it's maintained its forecast for FY26 at 6.3%. Nomura has lowered its FY25 projection to 6% from the earlier 6.7%. It's also cut its GDP projection for FY26 to 5.9% from 6.8%. Now, almost all of them expect a rate cut by the end of the financial year, not the calendar year, and some measures to boost liquidity in the interim, including a lowering of the cash reserve ratio mandated for banks. However, none of them are absolutely certain that the central bank will oblige with an immediate rate cut given the high inflation print. Now, the government says the GDP number is nothing to be alarmed about. The chief economic advisor, V. Anantha Nageshpran, says India's potential GDP growth is in the range of 6.5 to 7 percent, and the country should be able to achieve it on the back of actions already taken over the last 10 years. The Economic Affairs Secretary, Ajay Sheth, has a similar view, adding that the government is taking steps to ensure that growth accelerates in the second half of the year. Take a look. Chief economic advisor, I have already spoken to all of you on the day the numbers had come in and uh, the numbers are it's not an alarming numbers are lower than uh, what our potential is and action is well on the way to make sure that the second half of the current financial year uh, the number gdp growth rate is expected to be much better and several high frequency indicators in the month of october are uh, pointing towards that well, that's the Economic Affairs Secretary. So what does the CNBC TV18 Citizens MPC make of the RBI's MPC, which meets on the 6th of December? Lata is standing by with the Economist view. Lata, is a rate cut now likely? Is it even possibly on the cards? Well, the Citizens MPC is a fairly good representation of the market and of the academic community as well. You know, what ought to be is also there and what we would like. Four is to one, they expect a pause on rates. So no cut, only Nomura expects a cut. But uh, three is to two, majority expect a CRR cut, a cash reserve ratio cut. Now, all of them, however, expect that this repo rate cut, the interest rate cut, will come in February. So four of them expect in February, one in December. It's only a question of a, 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 a two-month later timing. Inflation, of course, in the uh, policy statement will be increased. Now, I didn't take a poll in, in my citizens' MPC, but the general poll I took of all respondents, the expectation is it will be about 4.8. At the moment, the RBI has a forecast of 4.5. They will have to up it to 4.8. So that's the point that the MPC was making. At a time when you're, you know, forget the lag number, that is 6.2 in October, above the MPC's mandate. They have to keep it within 6. So there is no way they can give a rate cut when the last number is 6.2 and you're forecasting an increase from the previous uh, forecast. So that's why they're ruling it out. The other big reason why they're ruling it out is that at a time when liquidity is tight, banks cannot pass on a rate cut. They will have to cut it for 
those loans that are linked to repo, what you call the EBLR loans, external benchmark linked rates. But for the other loans, like a car loan, you know, it's a fixed rate. They will not redu reduce it because deposits are still costly. The expectation is that if it's a CRR cut, that is possible. You know, uh, after all, you have to set aside less idle money every time you make a deposit and therefore you can pass it on as a uh, benefit to the borrower. So the expectation therefore is a CRR cut. Growth forecast will have to be slashed. My poll said that it'll be 6.3, but uh, there are, uh, uh, you know, uh, people who are from six to six and a half in my poll. All right, Lata, many thanks for joining us. That's what we will be watching out for when the MPC meets later this week. Here's a look at the key business headlines that we're also tracking at this hour. India's manufacturing activity easing to an 11-month low in November, according to the HSBC India Manufacturing PMI. Rising competition and input prices have contributed to the fall. However, the manufacturing PMI has remained in expansionary territory, fueled by a four-month high in new export orders. Meanwhile, China's manufacturing activities hit a five-month high in November, according to an S&P Global survey. This is Chinese manufacturers saw incoming new orders rise at the fastest pace in more than three years. The reading largely echoes the country's official data that showed manufacturing activity expanded, albeit modestly. Adani Group Chairman Gautam Adani has responded to the bribery charges level against the group by the U.S. government at a Gems and Jewelry Awards event in Jaipur. Adani, in his first public remark, said that no one from the group has been charged with any FCPA violation. He also reaffirmed the group's commitment to regulatory compliance. Take a look. Fact is that despite a lot of the wasted reporting, no one from the Adani side has been charged with any violation of the FCPA or any conspiracy to obstruct justice. Yet, in today's world, negativity spreads faster than facts. And as we work through the legal process, I want to reconfirm our absolute commitment to world-class regulatory compliance. Well, that's Gautam Madani. CNBC TV 18's news break confirmed the government has withdrawn the windfall tax on aviation turbine fuel, crude products and petrol and diesel exports. The levy, which was introduced in 2022, has come to an end effective immediately and it's expected to bring relief to oil companies. Timzi is standing by with the details. Timzi, we had reported way back uh, uh, a few weeks ago that this is uh, possibly on the cards. Take us through what this now means as far as government revenues are concerned. Well, we told you first when this levy was to be introduced and now we told you again first when this levy was to be discontinued. And now it is confirmed that after being in existence for almost over two years, the government on 2nd December decided to withdraw the windfall gains tax, which was levied on the exports of crude oil, ATF, petrol and diesel with immediate effect. Just to give a backdrop why this levy was discontinued. Well, the levy was introduced on 1st of July 2022. So far, it has yielded government about 44,000 crore of revenue. But since in the current fiscal, the revenues were slipping and not yielding much, the government on industry demand decided to hold a detailed review of the tax to assess whether it should be continued or not. In the first year of the levy, government had collected around 25,000 crore rupees from this. And in FY24, the collection slipped to almost half at 13,000 crore rupees, which were further declining to about 6,000 crore rupees in this fiscal, as most of the time after the fortnightly review, the levies were at nil. Sources told CNBC TV18 that the Prime Minister's office, on the request of the industry, took a detailed review of the levy with the officials of the Revenue Department and the Petroleum Ministry in November. During the review, it noted the challenges faced by the industry, the impact the levy was having on production levels, and the quantum of revenues it was getting from this tax. Post which, sources said that the PMO decided that the levy should be discontinued since industry was unhappy and it was unable to yield much returns to the government in terms of taxes as well as the average crude prices were also in comfortable range. So let's see now with this continuation what impact does it have on the crude oil uh, uh, production levels and yes the impact on these industries. Back to you. Timzi, many thanks for joining us. Here's the latest from the auto sector. Mixed bag in November. Sales data show healthy growth in the SUV segment. Two-wheeler exports shown as well. However, low-end passenger cars, commercial vehicles and tractors have seen muted demand. So Darshan is standing by with the auto sector's report card. Sud. 
Overall, it's a mixed trend for the auto sales for the month of November. For two-wheelers, exports have led the growth, whereas domestic sales have remained muted. For passenger vehicle segment, SUV continues to lead the growth, but commercial vehicle sales remain under pressure. Now, starting with Maruti Suzuki, sales for the month for, uh, sales for the month of November were a minor beat to our estimates, and sales were largely led by the SUV segment, which was up 20% year-on-year, but compact segment sales have fallen 5%, and with this total sales were up more than 10% year on year. Coming to TVS Motor, sales were better than estimates here, and it was led by exports and electric vehicle sales, and total sales were up 10% with electric vehicle sales rising 57% and exports rising 25%. For Bajaj Auto, like TVS Motors, sales were in line and was led by export segment. EV sales here have jumped 120% year on year, and when market share has increased to 22%. Total sales were up 5%, domestic sales though have fallen 7%, and exports saw an increase of 24%. For MM, like Maruti, auto segment was led by SUV. Total auto sales were up 12%, and SUV sales have increased 16%, and three wheeler segment also has seen healthy growth it was up 22%. Tractor segment, sales for the month of November were below estimates, but outlook is healthy. Company says good rabi crop expected to further boost the demand going forward, and total tractor sales were up just 2% year on year. Ashok Lynn, that is a pure commercial vehicle play, sales were a mild miss to estimates, total sales were up 1%, and total commercial vehicle sales were down 11% year on year. Coming to Ola Electric, the company has been in focus today, and for the month of November, Ola Electric's market share has fallen to 25%, that is down 500 basis points if you compare from the October 2024. But the question is, which companies have gained the market share? Major gainers were Bajaj Auto and TVS Motor. For Bajaj Auto, current market share is 22%, which is a gain of 200 basis points against last month. And for TVS Motor, market share is up 100 basis points. That is a gain. That is again 100 basis points against October. And now current market share is 23%. And Ola has been market share, losing market share at the time when company has announced several launches. As far as auto sales are concerned, it's a mixed picture for the month. Of November. All right, so many thanks. And speaking of Ola, the stock up in trade today after founder and promoter Bhavish Agarwal pledged 1.1% of Ola Electric's equity. This is about 3.65% of his stake in Ola. The shares have been pledged to raise debt funding for Ola's AI startup Krutram. Agarwal held 30.02% of the company's total shares as of September 30th. Now, 1.72% of equity of CIPLA changed hands in four block deals today. Remember, CNBC TV18 had reported that CIPLA's promoters were looking at selling up to 1.72% of the company's equity via block deals. Sources add that the total size of the transaction was estimated to be around 2,000 crore rupees. We will head into a break, but up next, Parliament log jam continues. Both houses adjourned for yet another day without any significant business being transacted. That and more when we return. After a week of complete washout, both houses of parliament adjourned for yet another day amidst sloganeering from opposition MPs. The opposition has accused the government of evading discussions on issues like the Adani bribery allegations, the unrest in Manipur and violence in UP Sambhal. The Lok Sabha Speaker Om Birla met with opposition lawmakers earlier today to arrive at a solution to break the logjam. Cyclone Fengal, which made landfall along the Puducherry Tamil Nadu coast over the weekend, caused heavy rainfall across both regions. Puducherry, which received its highest rainfall in 30 years, remains flooded. The army had to step in to evacuate stranded persons in inundated streets. All private and government schools remained shut across Tamil Nadu and Puducherry. Parts of Delhi and Noida witnessed heavy traffic jams as farmers from at least 20 districts in UP marched towards parliament in the national capital. The Bharatiya Kisan Parishad called for the protest to press for demands for a farm loan waiver, pension and reinstatement of the Land Acquisition Act of 2023. More farmer organizations have planned marches towards Delhi on the 6th of December. 
In international news, Russian President Vladimir Putin has received an invitation from Prime Minister Modi. According to a Kremlin aide, the dates for the trip are expected to be set in early 2025. Remember, this will be Putin's first visit to India since the beginning of the Russia-Ukraine war in February 2022. U.S. President-elect Donald Trump has threatened to impose 100% tariffs on BRICS nations if they were to introduce a new common currency for trade. He's also sought a commitment from the BRICS nations they will not undermine the U.S. dollar. Trump's missive to BRICS nations comes months ahead after Russian President Putin called for an alternative international payment system to prevent the U.S. from using the dollar as a political weapon. However, there's been little progress on that front. And with that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of Business 360. The news will continue right here on CNBC TV 18. Stay tuned. We're back in a moment with more.